You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. If you have kids, then you've probably noticed a phenomenon that as a parent I have noticed several times, and that is the children have the ability to listen to a warning and then to go on as if the warning were never given. Notice that about kids? They're running around the front room, coming perilously close to tipping over a cup of iced tea on the on the table or hitting their heads on a shelf or something, and you can tell them if you don't stop and you continue that course of action, you're going to hit your head on that, and that's going to hurt. And then as a good parent, I sit back and I watch for them to get hurt. I let them hit their head because at our house, we live by a little motto, when you burn, you learn. You get hurt, and that is a good teacher. Then they will know, Dad, oh, Dad warned me about that. Paul told them it was coming. Savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Not only did he tell him tell them that it would happen, he told them when it would happen. After my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Not only did Paul tell them that it would happen and when it would happen, he gave to them a description of how it would happen. They would come from the outside into the flock to ravage the flock. And men from among their own selves would stand up and speak perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Unfortunately, the warning that Paul gave them, in spite of telling them that it would happen, when it would happen, and how it would happen, in spite of the three years that Paul spent with these elders in Ephesus, warning them night and day with tears and all of the teaching and everything that went with that, in spite of all of that, Paul's warning in Ephesians to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 went unheeded. And what Paul said was going to happen, happened. You know how long it took for it to happen? You know how long it took for it to happen? 15 years? 20 years? 5 years. The warning was given in, in Acts chapter 20 in 58, the, the spring of 58 A.D. By 62 and 63 A.D., when Paul was released from prison and he made his way back to Ephesus, he found that within five short Years the church had been brought to the brink of theological and moral ruin because of these men who had crept in from outside and sprung up from amongst their own numbers speaking perverse things. In less than five years, three men that we are told of in First and Second Timothy, Philetus, Hymenaeus, and Alexander, those three men had begun to speak perverse things about the Old Testament law had begun to teach Jewish myths and focus on the genealogies of the Old Testament. And in less than five years, they had literally brought the church to ruin. And so Paul left Timothy in Ephesus in 62-63 A.D. And he went on from there and then he wrote 1 Timothy to him and 2 Timothy. And that's how we got those epistles. The Apostle Paul, in effect, left Timothy in Ephesus to do what the Ephesian elders had failed to do and that is to teach the sheep and to beat off the wolves because they had crept into the church in less than five short years. Now I ask myself, how did that happen? How did it happen? Did they not listen to what Paul had told them? Did they not take him seriously? Did they think to themselves, it will never happen on our watch? Certainly it would never happen to us. Maybe in a generation or two, or three from now, a hundred years from now, maybe then the church would succumb to false teaching. Or maybe it is that Philetus and Hymenaeus and Alexander were already in the church. Maybe Paul had them in mind when he said, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Friends, maybe, maybe one or all of those three men were on the beach with Paul listening to this warning. Hearing Paul say, from amongst your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things. I don't know. I don't know how it happened, but the fact that it happened serves as an object lesson 
to every Christian about the seriousness of what Paul was warning them in Acts chapter 20. You'll need to turn there because today is part three of Paul's description of a protective ministry. Acts chapter 20. (coughs) I'm going to try and get through this with my voice. So if I don't (coughs) jump and shout and, and yell and fluctuate my voice like I normally would on a Sunday, it's because I'm trying to preserve this so we can get all the way through all of this. Acts chapter 20, beginning at verse 28, Paul describes to them a protective ministry. And the first thing he does is he explains to them the mandate that these shepherds have to protect the flock. Verse 28, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Then Paul goes on in verse 29 and 30 to describe the men from whom they were to protect the sheep. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. Now in verses 31 and 32, which we're going to look at this week, Paul describes to them the method for protecting the flock. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day, for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I want you to notice three things. We're talking about the method for protecting the flock. He's described the mandate. As shepherds, this is your God-given responsibility to protect these sheep from the wolves. Then he describes the men. They'll come in from outside. They'll rise up from inside. They'll be attacked from, from both fronts, outside and inside. Men will arise speaking distorted and perverse things in order to tear away sheep for themselves. Then he describes the method of protecting the flock. Beginning in verse 30. One, sorry, verse 31. The Apostle Paul emphasizes three things. The first is watchfulness. Paul says, be on guard. Be on the alert. The word was used to describe somebody who was vigilant and awake. It meant, do not sleep. And it's used figuratively in the New Testament for being always alert and awake and ready for action. And I want you to notice that this isn't the first time that Paul has talked about alertness. It's back at the beginning of verse 28. Be on guard. And sandwiched between be on guard and be on the alert is this warning about the wolves. And this command to be on guard and be on the alert does not come in a vacuum. The Apostle Paul knows there were men in the church who would rise up, and there are men outside the church who can't wait to get in and ravage the flock. So Paul says, you have to be on the alert. You have to be vigilant and be on guard. See, friends, one of the one of the elements of being a good elder, a good shepherd, a good teacher, and even, for that matter, a good Christian, is always being alert to the dangers that are out there. Always knowing that there are wolves on the outside, and there are wolves on the inside with sheep's clothing. And always being aware and alert to the danger that exists. Be on the alert and be on guard. Now is there ever a time when a Christian or when a shepherd can sort of lay down the, lay down the work and say, the danger is no longer there? Is there ever a time when an elder can sit back and say, we fought off the wolves, we have warned the flock, we have told everybody everything there is to know, We have taught through the entire New Testament. We have done our best, and now it looks like there are no more dangers out there. So we can sort of sit back on our haunches, oh, take a deep breath, and just cruise for a while. Has there ever come that time? In some reading that I was doing this week, quite unrelated to preparation for this message, I ran across these words from J.A. Cease. His last name is pronounced either Cease or Sice, depending on what part of the world he comes from. So Cease Sice wrote this. Never indeed has there been a sowing of God on earth, but that it has been oversown by Satan, or a growth for Christ which the plantings of the wicked one did not mingle with and hinder. The church is not an exception and never will be as long as the present dispensation lasts. Even in its first and purest periods, as the scriptural record accounts, it was intermixed with what pertained not to it. There was a Judas among its apostles, and Ananias and a Simon Magus among its first converts, a Demas and a Diotrephes among its first public servants. And as long as it continues in this world, Christ will have his Antichrist, 
and the temple of God its men of sin. And he who sits out to, sets out to find a perfect church in which there are no unworthy elements and no disfigurations proposes to himself a hopeless search. Go where he will, worship where he may, in any country, in any age, he will soon find tares among the wheat, sin mixing in with all earthly holiness, self-deceivers, hypocrites, and non-Christians in every assembly of the saints, Satan insinuating himself into every gathering of the sons of God to present themselves before the Lord. No preaching, however pure, no discipline, however strict or prudent, and no watchfulness, however searching and faithful, can ever make it different. You hear that? Not the ringing of the phone. (laughs) The quote. Did you hear that? No amount of discipline, no amount of preaching, no amount of watchfulness can ever change the fact that in every church there's tares. In every church there are unbelievers. There are hypocrites. Satan is present at every gathering of the saints. When they come together, and as long as we're on this earth, that's the way it's going to be. There will always be dangers. You say, well, then why guard the flock? Why warn the flock? Why worry about it? If dangers, if, if all of the watchfulness in the world cannot remove the threat, then why worry about it at all? Because the point of watchfulness is not to remove the threat. The point of being watchful is to guard against the threat. God has so ordained that as long as His church is here, we will be threatened from the inside and we will be threatened from the outside. And it will always be that way. So Paul says, be watchful. Be watchful. second thing he emphasizes is the warnings. Look what he says in verse 29. Sorry, verse 31. Be on the alert, remembering the night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease, cease to admonish each one with tears. Night and day for three years. How long was Paul in Ephesus? Three years. Remember two years teaching at the school of Tyrannus? Three months in the synagogue before they kicked him out of there. And at some point before, in the middle or after that, there were some periods of time that made Paul in Ephesus for almost three full years. And Paul says, for three years, I did not cease to admonish, to warn each one of you with tears. Night and day. Now, he's not exaggerating and he's not lying about that. This is what Paul literally did. It's kind of a hyperbole. First Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul says, you yourselves know that I worked night and day with my own hands to provide for my own needs. It doesn't mean that he literally worked 27, 24-7 for three months while he was in Thessalonica. It's his way of saying, all the time. Whether I was teaching daily in the school of Tyrannus, or whether I was teaching privately in the homes, from house to house, you know that during the daytime, at nighttime, every time I had opportunity, I warned you that this was going to happen. And he did this for three Years. Some of you are exasperated that we've been on this subject for three weeks. Paul did this night and day for three years. Warning the flock constantly. There's danger inside. There's danger outside. Would you have been exasperated with that? Man, Paul, I get sick and tired of you always talking about the dangers. I just wish for once you'd say something kind about somebody. I just wish for once you'd get off this constant danger, this warning. You're always throwing up the red flags. You're always warning us. You're always sounding the alarm. Could you just talk about love and everybody getting together and having a good time just once in a while, Paul? Three years he did this. And look what he says. I did it with tears. Why the tears? It wasn't the physical sufferings that made Paul cry. It wasn't the afflictions that he endured. It wasn't his physical infirmities that he had from the bout with malaria. It wasn't anything with his eyes that caused him to cry. What was it that made Paul weep? It was his passion for the truth. As the Apostle Paul warned these Ephesian elders of the dangers, he himself was well well aware of them. And he could picture in his mind leaving them and knowing that as soon as he left, the wolves were going to come in. And knowing what a wolf does to a flock, knowing how it savages the flock and divides the flock, knowing how perverse men stand up and destroy entire households, Paul would weep. I can almost picture the tears in the eyes of the Apostle Paul as he would warn him about the false teachers and the false teaching. And listen, fresh in his mind is what happened in Galatia. Remember what happened in Galatia after the first missionary journey? 
No sooner had he stepped foot into Antioch than he heard that those in Galatia, having so quickly turned from the gospel of Christ, the false teachers were walking right along his heels into wherever Paul left. And while Paul was in Ephesus, warning the Ephesians night and day with tears for three years, he was dealing with false teachers who had crept into Corinth. Do you remember the Corinthian catastrophe? And how Paul had to make the trip to Corinth and deal with that and write the letters to the Corinthians? And while he's in Ephesus, he's warning them with tears because at the same time he's dealing with the ramifications of the false teachers that were ravaging the church in Corinth. This was serious stuff for the Apostle Paul. It shows you how committed he was and how passionate he was for the truth, doesn't it? Friends, you show me a man or a woman, you show me a Christian today who has that kind of passion for truth where the presence of error and the thought of error overshadowing truth brings tears to their eyes, and I'll show you a rarity. That just doesn't exist. You know what we find happening in the church today? Sheep rolling over and exposing their throats and their bellies to the wolves. And then the wolf grabs the sheep by the throat, and the shepherd comes over to beat off the wolf, and the sheep attacks the shepherd and defends the wolf. I've had people defend Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland. I've had people defend... Uh, Robert Schuller and T.D. Jakes, and I am at a loss to explain such action. How can this be in the church? That we defend the wolves, we attack the shepherds. Just made Paul weep. Philippians chapter 3. He said, I've often told you, and now I even tell you, weeping that such men walk and their enemies of the cross of Christ, whose appetite is their God and whose end is destruction. They glory in their shameful things and they set their mind on things of earth. Just, just the thought of what the wolves would do to the sheep made him weep. I warned you, night and day with tears. And it just made him cry. Warnings were a part of the Apostle Paul's ministry, friends, because warning the flock is an act of love. You realize that? The shepherd warns the sheep and says, look, this is the error, this is the danger, this is the falsehood, and here are the ones who teach it. That is an act of love. A hireling, a hireling doesn't warn the flock. A hireling just says, hey, believe what you want to believe, buy whatever books you want to buy, read whatever you want to read, think whatever you want to think, I don't care what your doctrine is, you just come here, everybody just come together, we're not going to pick any theological bones or make any doctrinal issues out of anything. A hireling does that. And then when the wolves get into the sheep and they begin to ravage the sheep, they come from outside and they stand up from the inside, the hireling flees. It is an act of love to go to the sheep and to say, look, here's the error. And Paul did this constantly, night and day with tears. And you know how he did it? It was constantly teaching the people the truth. Night and day he taught. Night and day, as often as the text warranted, the Apostle Paul would raise the issues. It is required of shepherds, listen to this, it is required of those who teach the Word that they not only teach what the Word says, but they also contrast it with the error that is prevalent at the time. So that the error is exposed to the light of truth and it begins to shrivel up and wither away. And the people are no longer drawn to that, but that they are drawn to the truth. So not only must the truth be taught, but the error must be refuted. And that from the pulpit, as often as the text of Scripture warrants, is necessary. That's required. That's how Paul did that, night and day, weeping over them because he had such a passion for the truth. He emphasized not only watchfulness and not only warnings, but the third thing that he emphasized was the Word of God. And look at verse 32. And now... I apologize for that. And now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Paul says, I commit you to the Lord and I commit you to the word of His grace. Two things. I commit you to the Lord, first of all. This is what the Apostle Paul did in every one of his uh, churches. In the book of Galatia, uh, sorry, the book of Acts chapter 14, when the apostle Paul went back through the churches of Galatia, it says in verse 23 that he appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. That's what they did. They selected elders with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord, they commended them to the Lord. And this is what Paul does to these elders. He says, I gotta turn you over to the Lord. Because listen, a good shepherd knows this. Ultimately, 
The guarding of the sheep and the protecting of the sheep is not just the responsibility of the shepherd. There's another party involved here. It's the chief shepherd. It's the what Peter calls the overseer and the guardian of our souls. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. See, friends, we're His church. We're His flock. Ultimately, He has promised that He will keep all of us until that day. Ultimately, He has promised that He will preserve us. He will secure us. He will sanctify us. He will not lose any of them. That's His promise. Not one of those that the Father has given to me will I lose, Jesus said. Because that's the will of the Father. And so a good shepherd says, I have to watch and I have to warn, but at the same time I have to give them over to the Lord. Because ultimately, that is the Lord's work. Now you say, well then, if it's ultimately the Lord's work, then why do the shepherds have to do it? It's not either or. It's both and. Paul warned them night and day with tears and committed them to the Lord. It's both of those things. They go hand in hand. There is a trusting and a resting in the providence and the sovereignty of God, understanding, Lord, these are your sheep. We are your sheep. We need your grace. You have to preserve us and keep us. But then an under-shepherd says, but I have been committed by the Holy Spirit to the task of protecting the flock, and so I'll do it to my dying breath, whatever it costs me, whatever it takes. Both of those things are necessary. I commit you to the Lord. Second, I commit you to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified by faith in Christ. I commit you to the word of His grace. What other tool does a shepherd have than the word of God? Can you think of any? doesn't have any other tool, does he? But what else do we have as a church other than the Word of God? We have nothing. That's the only tool that a shepherd is given. All he can do is go to the sheep with the Word and say, here's what the Word says. Now, why does Paul just commend them to a book? Why does he just commit them to a bunch of words? Friends, that's not it. In the Apostle Paul's mind, in his thinking, the Apostle Paul viewed the Word of God as that active, alive agent which is at work in the hearts of believers. For him, it was the all-sufficient, pure, incorruptible, holy words of the living God. And that was sufficient for the Apostle Paul. And so he says, I commit you to the Lord, and I commit you to the word of His grace. Now, who in the world would insult either one of those by suggesting that something else is necessary? The Apostle Paul certainly doesn't. That's enough. Give them over to the Lord. Commit them to the Word. Friends, you know how central the Word of God was to Paul's time in Ephesus? We saw it all the way through chapter 19. We see it here as the Apostle Paul talks about teaching them publicly and from house to house, preaching the kingdom of God, admonishing everyone, not withholding back from them anything that was necessary. He describes his preaching ministry, and now at the end of it all, as he's about to walk away from these men, he just commits them once again to what? Word of God. That's all he has. I'm going to give you over to the Lord and give you over to the Word. See, friends, the Word of God is that which the Holy Spirit of God uses to save us. We've been born again not by a perishable seed, but by the imperishable, incorruptible Word of God. And this is the Word that was preached to you, Peter says. 1 Peter chapter 1. From your childhood you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Christ. It's the Scriptures. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. It is that which saves us. Not only that, but it, the Word of God is also that which sanctifies us. That's why Peter goes on after 1 Peter chapter 1 to say, hunger for the Word like a newborn babe, so that by it you may grow. It is that that grows us up and matures us and builds us up. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul describes the Word as that which works in us who believe. It is alive, it is living, it is powerful, it is saving, it is sanctifying, it is securing His people. And it is that thing that matures the saints and matures believers and grows them up. I told you a few weeks ago that I am passionate about the subject of preaching. This is why. Because I, for one, am quite tired and quite sick of insipid, weak, watered-down, doctrinally void messages that do nothing for the sheep. I'm tired of that. And yet, in the world, that's what we're given. And in the churches, that's what we're given. And we're told you can't emphasize Scripture. It drives people away. You can't talk about doctrine. That's divisive. We have to all get together and all agree and all be one. And I'm sick of that. I'm 
sick of messages that are empty of anything that pertains to Scripture. Just for the sake of everybody getting along and coming together. Friends, what would you think of a father who neglected to, to, to feed his newborn infant who was hungry and needed nourishment in order to survive and to thrive and to be healthy? What would you think of such a man that withheld nourishment from an infant child? Think he's a hero? Think he's noble? You think that's loving? What if he said, I do it in the interest of unity? I do it in the interest of not wanting to offend my infant child. I don't want to offer him milk. Milk might offend him. Milk might divide him from the other children in the playground. I can't do that. We would call him a criminal. We would call him a beast. We would call him an animal. We'd lock him away. We would disdain such an individual. But in the church, they're lauded. We're told that's the noble thing to do. That's the loving thing to do. Don't emphasize truth. Don't emphasize doctrine. Don't divide anybody. Don't offend the sheep or the seekers or anybody that comes to your church. Withhold from them the Word. Withhold from them doctrine. Withhold from them nourishment. And these men are lifted up and we're told that's how you reach 21st century America. That's the method that God blesses. And the exact opposite is the case. What is it that builds us up? It is the Word of God. Paul left Timothy in Ephesus to sort out the disaster there. He wrote 1 Timothy, and the book is all about preaching, teaching, instruction, rebuking, exhorting, dealing with false teachers and sound doctrine and words of the faith. That's what 1 Timothy is about. And Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy, Timothy, preach the word. And that command was not given in a vacuum. Why? Because Paul says there's coming a time when men will not endure sound doctrine and wanting to have their ears tickled, they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to myths, to fables. So preach the Word. Why the emphasis on the Word in first, 2 Timothy chapter 4? It's because of what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3. For deceivers and impostors and evil men will grow from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now that's curious instruction to me. Paul says, Timothy, people aren't going to want to hear the Word, so preach the Word. People will not endure sound doctrine, so give them doctrine. People will not tolerate the truth, so proclaim the truth. And Timothy, if he were alive today and had bought into the philosophy that ravages our churches, would have said, Paul, if people will not endure the truth and endure sound doctrine and put up with preaching the Word, then we need to find some way of giving them something that keeps them in the church. Paul said they'll leave. So do it. But Paul, they'll leave. That's exactly the point. They will leave. So you preach the Word because they can't endure that. You give them truth because they hate the truth. You give them sound doctrine because they can't stomach sound doctrine. But Paul, what if they leave? We don't want them to leave. We want people to come, people to stay. We want to give them something that they can stomach. No, Paul says they don't like truth, they don't like sound doctrine, they don't like preaching, they don't like the Word. Give it all to them. Just shovel it at them, Timothy, and they will depart. They will leave. Now friends, I'm not trying to run any of you off. Don't misunderstand that. But I'm just saying that that's curious instruction to me that the Apostle Paul would give to Timothy in the midst of false teaching. He says you give them the Word because they won't like it. So that's what he tells them to give them. We live in an age that we are ravaged by sheep, or sorry, by wolves inside. They're dressed like sheep. Friends, this is wolf repellent. That's what this is. This is wolf repellent. And there's nothing that is able to equip the sheep to discern the difference between truth and error like teaching the truth. There is nothing that equips believers to be able to spot false teachers and wolves like the simple, straightforward teaching of the Word. This is to a wolf what kryptonite is to Superman, what garlic is to vampires. They hate it. They don't like it. That's why Paul said you give it to them. You shovel it out in doses and you give them as much as you can. Teach and preach these things. And Timothy, above all else, Preach the Word. Why? Because it is that that is able to build us up, friends, and give us the inheritance among the saints. That inheritance that Ephesians 1 says we are predestined to. That inheritance that Colossians chapter 1 says we share with all the saints in light. 
that inheritance that Hebrews calls the eternal inheritance, all that is reserved for us in Christ. The Word of God saves us, sanctifies us, and secures us, and delivers us to our eternal inheritance and our eternal inheritance to us. And in that way, the Word of God gives to us the inheritance among all the saints. What else do you have? You have nothing. And friends, it grieves me to see shepherds abandoning the only tool that we have to protect the flock from the wolves outside and inside the church. So what does it mean to have a protective ministry? Summed up in a couple of sentences, it means this. For all of us as sheep, as sheep, it means that we should be alert to the dangers that are out there. That we should listen to the warnings that are given to us by those that the Holy Spirit has appointed as overseers of our souls. And that we would receive the Word of God implanted. So that by it we may grow. As shepherds, it means that the shepherds among us need to be alert to the dangers that are out there, know what they are, know who poses the dangers, and to faithfully warn the flock at every turn of any danger that threatens the flock, and then to faithfully teach and preach the Word, because it is that that will deliver us to our inheritance and our inheritance to us, and provide us, it is the Word that will provide us safe passage from here to the other side, to be with the shepherd and the guardian of our souls. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this morning and for this very serious warning that the Apostle Paul gave to these elders, these shepherds of the church. And we would ask, God, that you would give to us the grace to be alert, to heed the warnings, and to love and obey your word and use your word to test all things. We ask this in Jesus' name, for his sake and for his glory. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.